Pakistan. Right, and Muzammil, why don't we go ahead and start with a very interesting news. So today happens to be the International Day of Solidarity with, with the, the Palestinian Palestinians, people. Yes. And uh, uh, obviously the aim of observing this day is to show solidarity with the Palestinian people in getting their inalienable right to freedom and to establish their independent state on the national soil with Jerusalem as its capital in his message on International Day of Solidarity with Palestinian people, President Asif Ali Zardari strongly condemned the unabated Israeli aggression and reiterated the call for international community's role for an immediate ceasefire and an end to the genocide of the Palestinian people. And also Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif has reaffirmed the unwavering support of the Palestinian um, Arab people and the government of Pakistan for the just cause of the Palestinian and the inalienable <coughs> right of the Palestinian people. And they the also demanded immediate and unconditional ceasefire in Gaza. The Prime Minister stressed the urgency of ensuring unhindered humanitarian assistance Absolutely. as the Israeli genocide goes on in the besieged strip. And in his message on the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people, he said that Israel's brutal onslaught and aggression in Gaza and the West Bank since October 7, 2008 and 23 is one of the gravest human tragedies right absolutely and uh, everyone who's watching out there and everyone uh, who's witnessing the unfolding of the genocide we're really really sorry with what is happening out there and obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the absolute uh, embodiment of the justice and we have this faith within us that the justice will be served inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. right so Muzammil, why don't we move on to another very interesting development that is uh, that has unfolded in the cricketing world so why don't you uh, take the opportunity and speak about you know Pakistan I would, I would Zimbabwe. first I would first like to uh, talk about how our boys have been consistently putting on results you look at the recent test yeah. matches that were going on you look at the recent one days that were going on yeah. and now against Zimbabwe I don't know what happens the, in the tournament but I mean the test matches are absolutely uh, they are great and uh, Zimbabwe Pakistani right. players performed really really well I mean the cricketing world was excited we saw hundreds being scored on the pitch we also saw our Pakistani boys performing really well uh, on the crease and uh, as we talk further about Pakistan and Zimbabwe Pakistan beat Zimbabwe by 99 runs in the third and final one day international and before this they leveled the series one to one and this is what is great about Pakistani cricket you see a season where they're not performing and everybody's down and Pakistani people feel sad because of what's happening in the cricketing world and all of a sudden our boys jump up and start performing not one not two but three tournaments in a row right you know? and it's not just that i think it's also the fact that pakistan has also won the junior hockey asia, asia cup and yeah. that is uh, that, that's the, big yeah the, the, the medal that the pakistani uh, people have in their pockets and we are really really glad about it so pakistan outlast bangladesh by six nail in the junior hockey asia cup in muscat and secured their second consecutive win in the tournament Pakistan was leading by 2-0 after the half-time. Pakistan scored four more goals in the second half. Sufyan Khan scored hat-trick for the Pakistan, while Muhammad Aman, Rana Walid and Zikaria netted one goal each. Pakistan will face Oman in their third match on such a day. And absolutely, uh, best of luck to Team Pakistan. Best and may the best Pakistan. of the team win in this tournament. Inshallah. Inshallah. So now, let's, uh, today it's Friday, and let's uh, move on and unfold the conversation, which is a topic that is... Uh, I would say a health emergency it has been declared across the world because the pandemic of the mental health crisis is on the rise across the world. Ranging so, from youth to old age, yes, it's, yes. it's across the board. And Muzammal, there's something that we are not doing it right because if you see the amount of the luxuries that are available to us, the material progress that human civilization has made, but why is it that we are unable to fulfill ourselves and why do we see 
the depression, the anxiety, the mental illnesses on the rise. There's something absolutely true, true. that we are not doing it right. Uh, is it uh, in the realm of the spirituality that as a human civilization, we are lagging behind? And what are the causes, uh, you know, contributing for this depression, anxiety and true. mental crisis, mental health crisis in general? We are very glad that uh, we have been joined to talk on the mental health care. Uh, Professor Dr. Rana Modar Saab, he happens to be a psychologist. Assalamu alaikum, sir, and thank you so much for coming to our show my pleasure i'm a psychiatrist okay okay this I'm is really an inherent issue with our profession <laughs> i'm really uh, sorry about that so uh mm. professor saab uh, let's unfold this conversation you know what is it in our lifestyles that we are doing wrong that is con or i don't know which we are not doing it which is contributing towards this mental health crisis which is across the, the world on the rise mm. see when the, whenever there is a health crisis uh, always remember that there's not a unitary single cause leading to this effect. There's always a multiplicity of uh, causes, multiplicity of factors that play a role. I think one of the basic factors is uh, the lack of resilience in people okay. to deal with crisis and failures in life. Mm. Uh, as we grow and as the new generations are brought up, we have become highly protective parents who tend to put our children in a bit of a uh, vacuum and in a, in a crystal room where they do not let them be exposed to the day-to-day -day challenges of a life. Mm. Let's call them uh, overprotective parents. Right. And uh, they, have a, they have their own reasons given the kind of security circumstances that they let their children grow up in. Uh, so we, we start with, uh, from the moment of conception, during uh, the process of pregnancy, then the child rearing practices, right. school circumstances, the environment in which we are brought. Two fundamental issues that can be very easily addressed mm -hmm. is to try and look at the issue of mental health uh, as a responsibility that I have towards myself. Okay. Right. You see, the, f the fundamental blunder is that when I make my mental health your responsibility, I expect my children to make me happy, my mm. spouse to make me happy, my parents and neighbors and friends to make me happy. So oh, you yeah. shut yourself off from that inner work that you need to do in order to Absolute. become a more sated and Absolute. happy person. Absolutely. So, wow. so let us look That's at mental health as a bank. If mm. I'm not going to deposit anything in the bank, mm -hmm. how, how would I withdraw? draw anything out yeah. from it? What to talk of the profits and the dividends? Mm. Uh, so I'm not ready to invest in my own mental health mm. and I become extremely dependent on what you do to me. As we're talking about this factor where we are not, uh, not taking the responsibility for our own mental happiness mm. and we are depending on the world outside yeah. to satisfy us mentally, yeah. Yeah. let's talk about how children face in today's world a difficult time coping with all of the information that is thrown at them because we have got social media, we have got... Uh, places where they are constantly bombarded with the information and a, a youth in their prime will think about their future, what I want to be, the path that I would want to pursue, the character that I want to become a few years from now. And all of that gets a little bit too much for their nerve to handle. And do you think that uh, this issue that you said that we don't work on our inner self and we depend on the world outside, that the young child a teenager maybe, or somebody in his early 20s, would be mentally aware of this factor? Absolutely. You see, first of all, you need to understand that the digital technology is here hmm. and it's a reality and hmm. you start to hand over your mobile phone and uh, your laptops to your children when they were <laughs> in, in, you know, two or three or four months Very old. Very young, yes. You know? so, so once you're exposing them to digital technology, hmm. it's right out there, it's like electricity now. Absolutely. So what do you do with electricity? Do you actually not teach children from the very beginning how to protect themselves? Yes. So you, we can't really wish off uh, our future generations to not be exposed to digital technology. We need to tell them the value system mm. that is required mm. to deal with dig digital technology as a tool. Mm. See, the tool like the one that you are wearing right now right. to hear what the producer is saying. Right. The, the tool that we're using as a camera to communicate with the world, what a beautiful thing it is. Mm. But if this tool starts to run my life mm. and I become a tool in the hands of this technology, I'm done. Mm. 
So what we are doing is that we are not really equipping our children to use this as a as one of the greatest inventions ever. Absolutely. You know, and from a horse to a car, you mm -hmm. always make a child learn how to drive at a particular age. Then you allow that child to drive safely. Then you license that child mm -hmm. to go out and then uh, you know be on the road. Right. What about digital technology? A similar tool, but you hand it over without a license, without any training, mm -hmm. and you expose a child to it far too early. Without really understanding, without the understanding that how digital technology can be a huge resource of happiness, joy, uh, you know, he, he can do things with it that no generation earlier than him could or would have done. Right. And uh, Dr. Saab, we can't deny the fact that, I mean, we have given the power to the mobile phone, to the social media as a source of our dopamine, right? Uh, it's an artificial source, obviously, it's very debatable, but when but we talk highly about... Addictive. Highly absolutely, addictive. Absolutely, absolutely. No one can deny the repercussions <laughs> yeah. that we have by gluing ourselves to the screen. But Dr. Saab, on the other hand, if you see younger, so, I, you know, I see younger kids, you know, and, and my cousins and my family members and my friends, they're raising up their kids. And I, I tell them, you know, it's very harsh and it's very, really bad that if you are giving the mobile phone and, and you know, the kids are eating the food with the mobile phone on, right? And they say that they make our lives easier. So, but then they also say that you're not a mother yet. And when you become one, then you will know that how <laughs> difficult is it raising a child, right? Because they're throwing the tantrums. So if you want to remove or minus that factor, right, you know, then how do you deal with those tantrums? <laughs> as a younger generation, as a millennial, I'm asking you. Okay, okay. Yeah. I mean, let me first ask you, if you had a six-month-old, not you, but any, anybody uh, else. Yeah. I apologize for barging in like this. My daughter turned one last month. Okay. So, so suppose this, this is very useful advice so and a great question by Ms. Hajra. Great question. So let she me direct keeps it to throwing tantrums absolutely. all the time. Absolutely. So she's very hungry yeah. and she's throwing a tantrum. Uh -huh. Would you bring her a Big Mac to eat? No. <laughs> because she can't really digest it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So first of all, understand that just because you lack the skills of dealing with a tantrum, mm -hmm. you find a very easy way out of distracting her. It's typically like a brushing the dirt in a room under the carpet. Mm. So you need to first of all understand that before you produce a one-year-old child to be sitting out there throwing at a tantrum, where did she learn all this from? Were well, the tantrums being thrown around her? her. Wow. You know, so she has obviously seen your wife throwing a tantrum, maybe you throwing a tantrum at her, <laughs> and that is how she has learned. Yeah. So your children learn what they see around themselves. Mm. Right, they do true. not learn the mother tongue as Urdu and English and Punjabi and Pashto and Sindhi and Balochi. Right. They learn all the mannerisms that is happening around them. Right. Then, they, then they throw that tantrum and you have not skilled yourself mm. or you've not learned sat down together mm. as a couple. Say, we, let's go to somebody and find out how do you deal with children with tantrum right. instead of handing over uh, that How to deal with that? We're asking you okay, as a psychiatrist, okay. now, right? Le let us look at hmm. that a child has the right to show right. and communicate to you her dissatisfaction, her hunger, Absolutely. and her language is not really developed. Right. You see? Absolutely. So if you try and predict what is the likely cause of this tantrum mm -hmm. earlier. Now, for example, a child is wet mm -hmm. and she cannot really go and change her pamper mm. uh, on her own. Maybe the child is thirsty. Mm. Maybe the child is sitting in an uncomfortable position. Right. Maybe the child is feeling neglected and ignored. Children hate this situation of being left to themselves. Mm. So both of you are having a conversation or watching TV and that little child is sitting all by herself looking into thin air, doing nothing. So if I was her, I would throw a tantrum. Mm, mm, <laughs> You're my parents, why are you not looking at me? Yeah. So, you know, we've started to look after ourselves so much mm. and we get engrossed mm. and we keep producing children mm. about whom we know less and less mm. and we feel less and less responsible towards them. Mm. The other big issue that has uh, happened in houses is that, you know, it, it, it's a famous saying that it takes a village to raise yes. a child. Absolutely. Here are these uh, young couples who are stuck on the 14th floor of a high riser yeah. all by themselves. Absolutely. They have left their parents, mm. you know, they left their cousins, they've left their uncles and aunts. They have no friends. So what are you surrounded with? Technology. 
So that's the, the only company you have left, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So therefore, when you are left. frustrated, when you, when you are done, Lack you know, of human interaction. And, and you are you're yourself extremely stressed and angry mm -hmm. with yourself. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the only thing that you have at that time is not an uncle, auntie, or a chacha, a khala. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. before this, we would say, Ammi, please take this child from me. You know, but, she's but very angry. Uh, uh, now it's a mobile. You hand it to her. Right. Wow. But Dr. Saab, uh, <laughs> just, you know, um, as a counter argument to this entire scenario, so our generation, the billionaires, we are really talking in terms of having healthy boundaries, right? So we have grown up in the environments and we have seen that, you know, um, we've grown up in extremely communitarian setups, right? Where we have a support system, nani, dadi, etc., right? But the younger generation, the newer couples, they're talking that we need to have some he healthy boundaries and we need to have space in order to have more healthier relationships, right? But obviously, the one downside to the this entire scenario is that you know like you said it takes a child a village to raise a child right um, but then how do we tread that very fine line between developing a healthy boundaries and also making sure that you know your child have enough support system to grow up in that environment right you see absolutely uh, nobody is objecting to your right to healthy boundaries or space but, right emotional uh, and physical well i'm not really know. sure about the space part of it okay. you know see if you're going to fill up space with technology Hmm. If you're going to fill up your space with articles and artifacts, right. who would you turn to when the child is not really right. comfortable? Right. The second issue is that we have a very low frustration tolerance uh, when we are raising children. Absolutely. You see, we do not understand that crying is one of the best exercises that a child does. Okay. You know, so, so is it, it? It's a, yeah, absolutely. How would the lungs expand? Wow! If, if <laughs> parents, as 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 a young parent started starting oh, off, you get very uh, nervous. Life, I, we get nervous. We're yeah, like yeah. a child should not cry. No, 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 crying that's, is that's, something that's bad. That's not right. A child has the right to cry, like we have the right to speak. Absolutely. Crying oh, is one right. of the ways of communication. This is new information for me as well. See, this is the, the two things that ch the children thrive on, mm. or they grow up, or they seduce mm. their parents mm. through crying and smiling. Mm. Mm. You know, these are the two only methods that they have. So when they don't like what is going on, they would cry. Hmm. So you have a right to disagree with me. Hmm. So give this right to the child. Give the right to the child. Or just child. one last question. Um, yes. Talking about emotional regulation. Yeah. And as you said, it takes a village to raise a child. Absolutely. Past my 20s, mid 20s, entering my 30s, now about to get to my mid 30s, I still feel like I am that same 15 year old, 14 year old boy inside at heart, right? And sometimes we need emotional support as well. As grown ups, we need emotional support as well. Not being a part of a larger community, not having your extended family around you, you don't have shoulders to lean on. You don't have people to go to. You don't have your elders to talk to or even a sensible cousin to have a nice chat with who can calm your mind down. And we are sometimes overstimulated. What effect does it have on our children? Well, absolutely. You see, emotional regulation actually comes in an individual through the development of a certain part of the brain, hmm. which we call the lobe of civilization. Uh, the lobe which is of civilization. Civilization, mm -hmm. the part that I've injured. <laughs> <laughs> this frontal lobe, yeah. uh, right here, sitting in front, you know, when we bow down and touch our Jaina Mars, mm. we touch with this mm. lobe of civilization. Mm. See, so this is a part that actually regulates our emotions. Mm. See, when we deal with more and more people, when we learn to interact with more and people, more and more people, that is how we regulate our emotions. It's through you and her mm. that I'll be able to regulate how I speak. It's your nods, if you, it is your rejections, if you know, if it is your frowns, right. which will help me regulate my emotions. Right. Mm. So it's through human interaction, mm. more and more human interaction, mm. that you will enhance a greater degree of emotional uh, regulation. Absolutely. And and the tragedy is that we are reducing that human interaction with each other. We are trying to replace it with virtuality. Now, there is no harm in that. Hmm. I am a great digital technology fan. Hmm. I think virtual relationships are beautiful relationships because I, I can have a friend in Brazil. Hmm. I can have a friend in Russia. Right, uh, right. You know, and why not? But understand that there is something called dose of everything. Right. You see, even if you take a vitamin, hmm. it has to be taken in a dose. Absolutely. If, even if you take a protein, it has to be in a dose. We have overdosed ourselves with our virtual relationships mm. at the, and we've left our emotional regulation 
at the hands of this virtual relationship, virtual relationship. which is on a click. So I don't like the you. The more dangerous part is I that the algorithm delete. feeds on what you watch and it shows you more of it. Yeah. So if you're watching sad content, it will. Yeah. And uh, thank you for your time and thank you for your great information thank and great you. insight into child upbringing and psychological state of us adults. Absolutely. <laughs> Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Sir, for coming here. And I My think pleasure. this is a discussion that will keep on going on because there are so many nuances approach that we need to take in order to explore mental uh, health, mental illnesses that are on the rise. We're going on a short break and after we come back, we have interesting discussion lineup. Don't go anywhere. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back and before going on to the break, we had a wonderful conversation surrounding the mental health and it also happens to be Friday the 29th of November. It is the International Jaguars Day. So International Jaguar Day is being observed on 29th of November with an aim to draw attention towards the growth of the jaguar species and support the expansion of their natural habitats. The number of jaguars started to dwindle in 1960s and 70s when the animal was extensively hunted for its fur. In 1973, jaguars were classified as an endangered species. In 2018, International Jaguar Day was observed uh, by the Panthera Wildlife Conservation Society and the World Life Wildlife Fund in collaboration with the United Nations Development Programme and the Global Environment Facility to celebrate this beautiful species of the nature at its best, its skin and its... What a beautiful creation absolutely, of God. Absolutely, absolutely. Majestic, absolutely majestic. And with this more exciting news uh, about different cultures from different parts of the world, there is a painting of an, yes. uh, a Maori elder. Now, this is a community native to New Zealand. And the yes. price that it has fetched, the dollars of that painting, yes. 1938 oil painting of a Maori elder by a famed New Zealand artist and painter, Charles Frederick Goldie, was sold at a record price of an auction held recently. And you cannot guess 3.75 million New Zealand dollars. That's the price that it fetched, and which is equivalent to 2.2 million American dollars. The sale of, uh, to an undisclosed buyer makes it the most valuable portrait of a Maori in New Zealand's art history. Now, what this is on your screen is the picture that we uh, just told you about fetching a record high price. Right, and in a very interesting development. So a rare first edition Harry Potter book was auctioned for 36,000 pounds. Oh my God, I was a big, big Harry Potter fan, a Potter head back in my old days. So moving to another <laughs> auction, a rare first edition of a Harry Potter book, which was brought for 10 pounds in 1990, went under the hammer for 36,000 pounds. Wow. The first edition was sold at a rare book auctions in the Staffordshire, UK, with the buyer paying 45,000 pounds in total, which included a buyer's premium. The buyer's premium is the additional fee which the winning bidder has to pay. According to Hansen's auctioneer, the book is one of the 500 hardback copies published in the first ever Harry Potter book print run in 1997. That is a very interesting yeah. development. Well, J.K. Rowling's writing is pretty good. It takes you Absolutely. to that wonderland of magic and wonderland where Harry Potter, his friends, mm -hmm. and all of those characters. Pretty, pretty, yeah, pretty yeah. amazing, though. Yeah, yeah. Which was your, fav your favorite character, if you don't mind me asking? Um, I was uh, always more inclined towards um, Voldemort. Oh, really? Uh, that's, that's a weird choice, I know. But um, without the presence of evil, you can't actually see... Yeah how good is the power yeah, of he was good. a genius i mean you can't deny the fact yeah. but obviously he directed his all of his energy towards i'm just the jesting with you it was always harry potter Sorry? i'm just jesting with you it was always okay. harry potter okay okay that's wonderful but but i think i would always go for the minerva mcgonagall i don't know there was something in the grace of that lady that always attracted me but mm. anyways uh, today happens to be friday and we are resonating with the spirituality that is always embedded 
as a Muslim in this day, the Friday, because it is the day that we Muslims hold very dear very to our uh, selves, right? Yes. So in order to unfold the conversation regarding the Friday and the resonance of the Friday, we are very glad that we have been joined by Dr. Aslam Khaki. He happens to be a religious scholar. Assalamu alaikum, sir, and thank you so much. Assalamu Thank you for inviting me. And it's an absolute pleasure hosting you, Dr. Aslam Khaki. So now, when we talk about the teachings of Holy Prophet Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, obviously sallam. there's so many aspects, there's so many dimensions, and I think it would take a lifetime of hours to discuss his teachings. Uh, but generally, whenever we talk about the social aspect of his personality, I would want you to go and delve into the character building aspect of that. Oh, thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. If we see that God. Almighty created the mankind, but did not leave it without guidance. Absolutely. For that purpose, he sent the prophets in series, right from Hazrat Adam to the lost prophet Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then he sent for the because the society always comes in the zulma, that is in the darkness, in the ignorance, with the bad habits, with the confusion. So the mission given to the prophets is that they should keep them or they shift them from zulmat ila nur from the darkness to the light to the light so yes. to this uh, purpose we can see that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and all the prophets came with the same mission of shifting the paradigms of the society from the paradigm of the darkness to the paradigm of the uh, light so in then in this context if we see on the character building so islam focuses on the character building by three uh, steps. Number one is by developing the mindset, that is the beliefs, mm. and then just giving them the trainings, which we can say ibadat or the rituals, mm. and then coming to the hakuk al ibad, that is the character building. The real purpose of all these beliefs and the uh, trainings, which are called ibadat, which include the prayer, five times prayer, the self discipline, uh, the purpose of the fasting, and all that. So the character building is the main thing, which is also called a taqwa, we mm. can say. Mm. So in Quran, if you see, Quran says that we have created you in different segments, in different tribes. Mm. But the person who is above all and who is good, a good person is a person who is muttaqi, who has the taqwa. Mm. <coughs> so, so taqwa can be translated that it is the taqwa, it is the character, good character of a person a civilized uh, person is called a muttaki. Mm. So with this uh, you know, target, we can say that the prophet was sent as a light for them and the purpose was given that he should shift the people from zulmat ila nur. Inna anzalna ilaykal kitaba li tukhri jannasa mina zulumat ila nur. That we have for that purpose, a book is given to the prophets. So Allah Almighty says that we have given the book the curriculum or mm. the set of the teachings so that you should uh, shift the people from darkness to the nur. Mm. Now the uh, issue is that or the discussion would be that what is the zulmat? Mm. So zulmat generally we say that the unguided life of the people is zulmat. Mm. As we say that in the room there may be many things uh, put in the room but mm. if there is no light, no nur then though the things which should be there, good and bad, there may be snakes, there may be scorpion, there may be good, you, uh, you can say, communities in the room. But if there is no light, you can't identify it. Right. So you would be astray. So the Noor comes to give you the capacity to differentiate between good and hmm. bad, which is called Noor and Hidayat. So Quran says that this book is, and again say, Fihi Hudawwa Noor, in all the books, even about the Torah, it is said, uh, that we have given the Old Testament or Torah to the mm. people, and there is guidance. Mm. And again, in the Anzalnal Injil, that we have given you the New Testament or the Injil. Indeed, to the Christians, it is being said, uh, said there is Nur and Hidayat for the Christian people. and. Torah for the Jews and mm. for Muslims, there is Quran. Fihi hudam wa nur. So, th in each and every step, for all the Ummah of all the communities of the Prophets, Hidayat and Nur, they are just collapsed together whenever they are talked. 
hidayat as i can understand is that quran gives you or the any uh, revealed book gives you the hidayah mean the content that how to live your life uh, dr asam paki because of the paucity of the time i would like to interject here and uh, redirect this conversation so for example holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he came and descended upon the people of makkah and he told them uh, he discarded their beliefs right and the, um, it, atheism that was abundant and all of the other religions that they were following them and he told them that it's not just the wrong gods that you're worshiping it's also the fact that entire system is based on the ignorance or the jahalat or jahiliya right yeah. and he said that you are abusing um, you know your daughters you're burying them alive and then he discarded their entire system the system of the riba the interest i mean nowadays yes we are muslims and fi- praying five times a day it's a, it's a ritualistic practice that we do that but when it comes to the social justice or the mores of the values that he upheld do you think we are clinging to that seera and the true sp- spirit in the 21st century uh, yes pakistani society yeah that uh, i would just dilate upon that we just take the ibadat as the ada they say that mm-hmm. as a practice yeah. as a habit not as a change yeah That's not for the change very unit. powering position yes. right because we've seen our ancestors yeah, do that yeah we say right? that this is what mm. i can conclude it in the way of mm. all the teaching mm. that these ibadat or the rituals mm. or the trainings to achieve mm. the social justice mm. to achieve uh, the per, uh, goal of eradication of the social evils and all that but we take the ibadat as the end product it's right. not the end product right. end product is our social justice mm. that why quran says about the life of the about the purpose of the sending of the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ke yahillu lahum at-tayyibat wa yuharimu alayhim al-khaba'is that this prophet has come to just tell you what is right and what is wrong right. so anything which is beneficial to the society mm-hmm. he tell you that it is beneficial you should do it mm-hmm. and anything which is harmful for the society or social a uh, harm mm. he just prohibits it that it's wrong he prohibits you not to take any intoxication drug he prohibits you not to tell lie he pro- uh, he just uh, guides you that you should not kill your daughter not you should kill the people all that you should not make the adulteration mm. so all these social evils he come up because these are called as khabais and the second role is the wajadu anhum israhum wal aghlal allati kanat alayhim the second role is that the man was clashed with the prohibitions with the undue barriers in the their life on undue prohibition or limitation the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came and he eliminated these undue unwanted uh, practices in the life one of the practices as you say that was the you can say an infanticide female inf- infanticide honor killing yes. forced marriages right? yeah. yeah forced marriages all he eliminated and gave the right to the women mm-hmm. that they can decide about their future life which was negated and even today it is negated Absolutely. that a woman even of what age is not given the right to decide about his future partner Absolutely. and if she opts Which is for that in sharia, yeah right but sharia gave it the right, right. the holy prophet gave it the right that you can't marry your daughters without the cons- without their consent so and similarly the society into the bounds of law and yeah, humanity no, this yeah. is an amazing friday morning and uh, the information that we've been getting from uh, the segment prior to this and uh, from this segment about the spiritual values and the values of Islam this is amazing information right. and uh, one last short question a really short one uh, what do you see that the youth of today lack sorry what what do you see the youth of today lack that that yeah. we lack in our character because of which we are being harmed mentally yeah. and spiritually yeah. what do we lack i would say that it is not the youth it is we we lack we lack that we are not the role model right. i am telling loy i am dishonest i don't go to my class in time i waste their time right. so it should be that if the role model they be, uh, if we the people around them the parents the teachers the ulama they all become or the politician if they become the role model they uh, tell the truth they do anything they want to see in their youth 
they should adopt themselves. Right, right. So and then right. the youth would adopt. And Lying absolutely. is the root of all evil. Remember this, all of you all and, who are watching this. And it's this. not just that we need to do the deeper self introspection that we need. But thank you so much, Aslam. Thank Mahkita, you so much, sir. For thank coming you. here, for yeah. spreading this awareness and cross pollination of the ideas regarding the life of Holy Prophet Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And earlier on, we were talking about how social media is an important fabric of our society. And we do see that nowadays, it's not social media is a very unique concept, is a very unique space in which a lot of people are uh, getting into. It's not because that they are able to see the content, but also they're able to create the content. And the new term that is being used for it is the prosumers. They're the producers and the consumers at the same time. So in order to further discuss the uh, cultural values and in order to further delve into this field of the pure prosumerism, I would like to say, um, is uh, uh, we've been joined by a blogger all the way from the Dubai. She is of the Lithuanian ethnicity, but uh, she wants to bridge a culture between Pakistani culture, her own culture, and also the um, multicultural sort of the approach that she is taking. We're very glad that we have been joined by Victoria. The thank you so much, Victoria, for joining us all the way from the Dubai. Thank you so much for inviting me, and I will say assalamu alaikum. Kya ala apka? Walaikum assalam. Thank you so much <laughs> once again. Walaikum <laughs> Bilkul theek. Right. And so, Victoria, please relate us to your experience of how did you, were you able to, I mean, bridge the cultures between Pakistan, between the culture of our own? What are the similarities? How do you compare and contrast between the two different cultures? Similarities, I would say it's very less. It's uh, more the differences. But I love the Pakistani culture because after marriage, we lived in Pakistan for three years. So I think I adapted quite well. I learned a lot of recipes from my mother-in-law, as I call her, Amma. And um, as well, people. People were amazing and so hospitable in Pakistan. Um, so there are a lot of differences. Uh, that's what I create content online about, about Pakistani culture and Lithuanian differences. I do before Pakistan versus in Pakistan. So I think uh, that's why people, for people, it's interesting to watch and I just share positive vibes online. Are you talking about, uh, by the way, I loved how you said, uh, kya hal hai aapka and amma. You know, <laughs> these things really show how connected you are to this part of the world. And um, since this is a Friday morning and after my shift, I'm going to go and have a really nice lunch with my friends. What's your favorite Pakistani cuisine? What's your favorite desi food that you had here? Oof, it's a very difficult question because um, it's not that what I just had. I cook almost everyday Pakistani food as well because my daughter is a true desi kid. She's seven years old and she loves Pakistani food. So I can say mutton pulao, karai, uh, paya Elisa loves as well. Uh, if, it's, if it's a desi snack, I love um, golgapas, uh, dhai puri, and many others. So I just can keep uh, telling more and more. Right. Uh, thank you for uh, you know delving into the desi cuisines out there. Uh, I was getting ideas off of her. <laughs> okay, okay, that's wonderful. Uh, but now let's move on to the content creation aspect of it. So Victoria, we know that I mean um, when we are scrolling through our screens, you know it just seems that you know this is just another content. But I mean it's very very hard. I mean doing YouTube is very hard. Instagram and all the other variations of the social media platforms like TikTok and other stuff. Um, it's very, very hard. So how did you uh, delve into the content creation? What inspired you to go into it? And how do you deal with the trolls? Because trolling is also an aspect of the social media um, when we talk about it. How do you deal with all of this scenario? That is true. So while I lived in Pakistan for three years, I did not start any social media. Once we moved to Dubai, uh, I started over here. Uh, because I just thought, why not to share the positive side of what I saw in Pakistan? It's like, you know, again, once you hear Pakistan in Europe, no one really knows about it. So I just thought, why not to share my perspective, what, how I lived over there, about the hospitable people, amazing food, shadi wala season, abhi Pakistan bhi hai. So I, I am unable to wear those beautiful clothes, right? So I was like, why not to connect with people and just share with them the culture differences? Uh, my experience, how I'm, we are raising our daughter as well. And uh, I think it just brings the positive side. So I hope that's how I connect with people. I, I always try to include as well Urdu English that uh, other people would understand 
what I'm talking about that Pakistani people would understand as well. I think uh, from their perspective, it's funny to see a foreigner who creates content about desi aunties, about Chazi season, who cooks desi food. Sometimes I get as well that uh, you are probably from Peshawar because my Urdu, you know, grammatic uh, is not that good. So I always, uh, I always just laugh about it. And I, I say I am half desi in my heart. In my heart, I'm desi, but in real, you know, just live there. And about uh, content creation, honestly, my husband, uh, let's see, inspired me. He just said you can do it it and it will be fun for you and you can share the positive sides of uh, our family how do we bridge let's say two cultures right how we are able to manage living with two different cultures because pakistan and lithuanian culture are very different uh, starting from food talking about hospitality we are more maybe conservative and Pakistani people are so open, they are always welcoming you. Uh, they, you are not taking no for an answer. Um, I always appreciate uh, the um, relationship between family bonds. But, uh, bond important, that it's very important. Uh, that's why I really respect and uh, I hope that uh, we can take it as an example. Right, and, and uh, Victoria, we see on the social media and when we talk about the Instagram or YouTube, there's always a personalized touch to it. So, for example, you said that you display or you talk about their family side, you know, what are you doing, what are your kids doing? Uh, and um, that's a very personalized stories that we are seeing the bloggers often portray. But again, then there was uh, within the social media culture, I see that there was a lot of trend of uh, getting the PRs and the collaborations right. that were happening, right? How do you think the uh, people or the consumers of the social media or digital native consume that trend? Because it does not have a very personal touch to it. If someone is getting PR, I mean, it's not very relatable to me as a human experience, right? So how, what do you have to say about this aspect of it? So if it's about the PR, I think the social media or content creators should just take the PR which they feel related to or what they personally tried, because that is true. Like, you know, um, content creators now, they, they, they can earn as well from social media, just taking PRs. But for me personally, I work with the brands where I feel that this is the brand I like. This is what I use daily, like, you know, Shan Masala or other Arab brands. I use it daily in my kitchen. So why not to share it with others? <laughs> so this is, I think, really important to understand and uh, share with others as well that what you use daily but again it's difficult to tell what is true and what is not it depends victoria, on the uh, yes uh victoria just a really quick question on something there you said you mentioned you're a half they see in your heart but there is a welcome saying that goes on here in Punjab and it goes G I N U. It's a welcoming statement. And we welcome you as a full Desi. You're a part of us. So <laughs> what was one of the most memorable trips on your three year journey here in Pakistan that uh, you enjoyed the most out of all the memories that you have here? Oh, that is a very difficult question. Um, maybe our trips across Pakistan that we traveled to Islamabad, we traveled to Karachi, to Multan and to see the differences between cities as well, because we lived in Lahore for three years. So Lahore and Islamabad, Karachi and Multan, each city has its own charm. Every city is really different. Food is different as well. I think these trips just made me understand that it's not just about the country, that every city has its own um, charm again, as I said, and uh, languages, oh, you not just have Urdu, you have Punjabi, you have, uh, uh, I think, Pashtu as well. And I was like, how you can understand each other? <laughs> so I just know Urdu, right? And right. Uh, my husband knows Punjabi, so sometimes I can catch some words, understand, but not all. So for me, it's like, I think it's just interesting to see how it goes. But the most memorable trip, I would say maybe Islamabad when we traveled as a family because our daughter was really small and um, it, it is again as a different city overall.
Right, right, and it has more a metropolitan vibe sort of to it, right? It's a very modern in the sense, and it, it has a daisy touch to it in the pickpockets. But uh, thank you so much, Victoria. It was lovely being, having you. For being on our show, for explaining to us about your experiences, about your lived experiences, and we are wishing you best of the luck in terms of the content creation and in your life ahead. With that, we are winding up our program. Until next time, so goodbye, Allah Hafiz, and good morning. Good morning.